In the previous lecture, we started the discussion of the full quantum configuration space for a collection of n point particles in three dimensions or higher. I mean, this discussion also works for two dimensions and lower. It just doesn't capture everything that we now understand could be possible. Towards the end of the lecture, I introduced two operators two projections that isolate the subspace of the collection of indistinguishable particles with single particle Hilbert space H. These projections isolate the subspaces relevant for the description of bosons or fermions. These two operators are projections, and when you and they act in a natural way on this Hilbert space here of indistinguishable particles, and they isolate out a subspace of states that are the ones directly relevant for describing configurations of n identical particles. So, using these guys, we introduce the following two subspaces. Here they are. called the bosonic subspace and the fermionic subspace, respectively. That's the content of the previous lecture. Today we're going to study these subspaces a little bit more and then we're going to introduce a larger space one that's capable of capturing all potential numbers of particles in other words we're going to convert the number of particles from a classical variable to a quantum number and allow superpositions of configurations with differing numbers of particles and the space that will capture all of this will be called fox space now there's the, the, these discussions can get relatively tedious, and so there's very shorthands that we're going to use. And one of the shorthands, which shouldn't be confused with another shorthand I introduced in the previous lecture, I'll write it now. So convenient shorthand. We're going to have multiple of this, multiple notations. Although these spaces have vastly different properties, there's a lot you can say that's universal for both. And so we want to do that as much as possible so that we don't have to always do a case distinction. We don't always have to write out the theory for the plus case and the theory for the minus case. We want to, as much as possible, do it all at once. And we're going to introduce a variable S, it's called lowercase s. And this variable is going to take the value plus 1 when we're talking about bosons and minus 1 when we're talking about fermions. And to a large extent, we can carry out our entire discussion now using expressions that depend on s. You'll see how this works as we go. So, for example, uh, we will write expressions like that. HNS. What is HNS? Well, I'll 
tediously write it out for this one case and then you'll get to see what, what I mean, obviously. So this is h plus n, which is this object we've defined up here. In the case s equals plus 1 and in the case s equals minus 1. So we're going to use this s variable quite a lot. It's quite convenient. And it allows us to do, to save as much writing as possible. So this theory we're talking about now is called second quantization, the, the theory of identical particles with Hilbert space H. And it's possible to make this very tedious, this part of, of the course. There's lots of combinatorics we have to keep track of. And the more we can reduce this combinatoric effort of writing stuff down, the better. The nice thing about second quantization is that as we go on, we will get better and better notations and we'll eventually arrive at an extremely compact way of specifying states in second quantized systems. And it's so convenient, you'll never ever bother doing things the slow way ever again. We've described the space of n bosons or fermions. It's called HSN. And now we're going to allow n itself to be a quantum number. This means is we're now going to allow ourselves the ability to take superpositions of states of identical particles with differing number of particles. And the full configuration space that allows us to express superpositions of states with differing numbers of particles, we give it a name, it's called Fox space, and it's written in the following way. Gamma S of H, so S is plus or minus one. And this is defined henceforth to be the direct sum introduce another notation straight away. definition so turn that into a definition this is the definition of a Hilbert space called Fox space that it's a Hilbert space will follow in a minute we'll show how to define an inner product on this space 
and that it's complete will follow when from the definition of the direct sum. So it's it's the direct sum of a countable number of Hilbert spaces. So it's actually a separable. It will be a separable Hilbert space at the end of this process. Why the direct sum? Well, the direct sum expresses the OR quantifier and the tensor product expresses the AND quantifier. So we're allowing, by taking the direct sum, we can say, we're saying our system is allowed to consist of N particles OR N plus one particles OR N plus two particles and so on. So direct sum means OR and whenever you have the ability to say AND or you want to express that, that possibility, you use the tensor product. But today, and in the, in the future for Fox space, we only need the OR quantifier. We don't expect to see a system comprised of three bosons and four bosons. This, this, <laughs> this hardly makes any sense. Ah, so there's something undefined here. What is HS naught? So N is allowed to be naught there. What could that be? I haven't defined that yet. That's henceforth defined to be the complex vector space, the one dimensional complex vector space C. It's very convenient to do things this way. You don't have to, but this is very convenient. This one dimensional vector space is going to have a, play a very special role in our discussion of second quantized systems of Fox space. It's going to correspond to what we call the vacuum. We're going to give the vector in that subspace a, a name. It's going to be called omega nor, uh, uh, omega. choose once and for all a, a vector in this one dimensional subspace gamma s naught. There's always this arbitrariness in this choice that you could choose any face, any complex multiple of this vector. Just choose one and from that moment onwards we call it omega and we're going to give this guy a name. Physically, what is omega? Omega is representing the configuration where there are no particles whatsoever. We have to allow that possibility. It might be you have a box of n bosons and then you get rid of all of them. Well, we have to be able to describe the state of the system when there are no bosons in the box. So that's the state that we cor that corresponding to that situation. No particles is omega. Well, we have now a space, and if all of these HS of Ns are separable Hilbert spaces, this will end up being a separable Hilbert space once we determine the inner product on it, which is also canonically determined. So we can start asking about the components of a vector in this space on various subspaces. So And the notation we're going to use for this is a, you take some vector in Fox space, something in this infinite direct sum, and then you ask, well, since these, each of these HS of Ns are 
subspaces of this infinite direct sum, what's the components of this vector on those subspaces, and this is the notation we're going to use for that. Good, let's write out those components. Let's just write out the vector now. Okay, that's just another way of saying this vector has those components on these subspaces. Now the scalar product is, is determined already by the definition of the direct sum. I'll just explicitly write it out. We just use the scalar product that comes from the underlying subspaces. So that everything is, we have all the data now we need to have, uh, to interpret calculations in this Hilbert space. It is a Hilbert space. And as long as each of those subspaces are separable, then it's a separable Hilbert space. That each of those subspaces is separable, well, that determines on what you say about little, about H. And throughout this course, we're always going to take H to be separable. All right, I think that's all we need for the, the basic kinematics of this space. Yeah. Right, let's start defining observables. We're going to get, this is, this is the kinematics done. We, we now know what our configurations we allow are. And now we can get to the, slowly to the dynamics. And the way we're going to get to the dynamics is by defining some uh, basic observables. That we allow in this, in this space. The first observable we allow we, we consider it to be an observation that's physically possible is the number of particles. Can we observe the number of particles in a, in a closed system of, of bosons or fermions? Well, the answer is yes. We hereby allow that as a measurement. What's the observable corresponding to this measurement? Well, it's the following operator here, n hat, defined according to this equation here. There we go. That's the observable. You can check that n is a self-adjoint operator. <laughs> 
lovely thing about Fox Space is it combines two notions of naturalness into one. It's one of these, f these moments when maths and physics, they, uh, they, they converge and both notions agree. So there's a notion of naturalness in mathematics expressed in something called category theory. And the production of one category from another, or the equivalence of one category to, of another via a thing called a functor is the way we express that naturalness. This Fox space construction is a functor from the category of Hilbert spaces to the category of Hilbert spaces. It's very, it, it's natural in that sense. It's also, natural in a physical sense. And that's what I spent the first couple of lectures arguing about. So once you've de decided on a single particle Hilbert space, H, that's the uh, difficult bit, that's the, that's the ill-defined quantization map part. From that moment onwards, the configuration space for n-identical particles, that's just completely determined. It's no mystery, it's just a functor. We're going to say that by express this by saying that Fox space construction what does it do? Well it produces from the configuration space of a single particle the configuration space for an indeterminate number of identical copies of that particle or identical particles. what Fox space does. So that's the kinematics. Now we've got to get onto the dynamics. do dynamics within a statistical theory, you either have to say what the observables are for all times, or you have to give the observables at a time slice and say how to change your time slice. So we're going to do the, take the latter approach, but it's worth pointing out that you don't need to do things that way. You could also come up with just a, a mapping for what observable corresponds to an obs observation at a certain time t. How are we going to do this? Well, we've got some criteria that we want this construction to satisfy. We want that if we just have one of these particles lying around, and we know the Hamiltonian that describes how this particle changes in time, we want that whatever we write down 
as the generator of dynamics for Fox space has to reduce to that when we only have one of these particles. All right, otherwise in what sense, in what sense is it the uh, describing a collection of these particles? It turns out this is actually, there's a great deal of arbitrariness in doing this. You can write down many, many possible uh, descriptions of dynamics that on the single particle space are the same as the one that you start that you want, but you can extend it in any way you like on the rest of the Hilbert space. But of course you want it to be consistent with the constraint that these things are identical particles. So it's not entirely obvious how to do this. So we'll have to argue about it a little bit. So let A be a linear operator from some Hilbert space H1 to another space H2. What we're going to do is use A to produce an operator on Fox space that naturally reduces to the action of A on the single particle space. Given a linear operator A from H1 to H2, it's easy enough to produce a linear operator from H1 tensor N to H2 tensor N. You just tensor A. And the beauty of this operator is, is that it, it respects the boson or fermion character of the subspaces H, S, So the action of U, of this permutation operator, commutes with the action of A, so it's, it will lead to a well-defined operator on the boson subspace and the fermion subspace. So A tensor to the N preserves H, S, or gamma S, comma N. <laughs> 
you do some notation for a tensor to the n. It's exactly a tensor to the n. But we're going to have it act on all the subspaces at once. So that allows us to build a new operator. If you think of A as doing some kind of operation on the single particle space H, so let H1 equal H2. So you think of A as performing some transformation, like a rotation of a block vector or something. Then A tensor N, you can think of that as performing the same operation on each of the uh, N identical particles independently. So very shortly, we're going to let A be a unitary operator. All right, we have some uh, observations to make about the norms of these operators. So the first thing to observe is that the norm of the tensor product of A n times, we can bound that. And that means that if A has norm less than or equal to 1, then A tensor to N has norm equal to less than or equal to 1. And furthermore, it's sort of a pretty short exercise. This gamma S of A has norm less than or equal to 1. So gamma S of A, if you think of A as performing a transformation, gamma of S of A is representing the transformation which does A on each of these identical particles independently. There's some other nice things to note about this gamma S thing. So gamma S of the identity gives us, well, the identity again. So that's pretty useful. And gamma S of A dagger is gamma S of A dagger. Okay, like you hope. And it has another property that's really cool. It represents, uh, it uh, respects products, which is an extremely useful fact. Ah, all right, that's, that's pretty true. <laughs> but that's more useful. 
Now, the most important place to use this gamma S of operation is on unitary ch changes of basis. So let U be a unitary operator, which is another way of saying change of basis. So instead of referring to states with respect to some position basis, you could represent, you could be the Fourier transform, which represents things in terms of the momentum basis, for example. Then this, making this change of basis on the many particle space is represented by gamma S of U. That's how it works. That's how we represent the many particle change of basis. And you can check that that's unitary very quickly. It's not given that it's unitary if U is, but gamma S of U is unitary. You just have to look at these three things here and then you'll know the answer. With this definition, we've uh, managed to find a way to produce very many unitary changes of basis all at once. Every single unitary operation on a single particle space now leads via this gamma S object to a unitary transformation on the many particle space. It's a very powerful tool to produce unitary changes of basis from a smaller set. Now there's one particular kind of change of basis that, that plays an important role in quantum mechanics and that's the propagator that tells us how the basis changes as time changes according to a Hamiltonian. So if we have a unitary which depends on some parameter t, namely time, then we have that t going to gamma s of ut is a possible propagator as well. Well, not quite. We have to check that this is continuous. But this is done as soon as we write out the Schrodinger equation for gamma s of t, gamma s u of t. very interesting exercise to do this calculation. <laughs> 
might look a bit unexpected, but we'll get to the, pr the argument for why this is correct in a second. convince ourselves that this is correct. The claim is that if you, this is a one parameter family of unitary operators on Fox space that we know already, we've proved that. The claim is that differentiating this with respect to T leads to this equation. Now this might not be so obvious. So I'll actually go through a couple of the steps to prove that. But as soon as you apply the Leibniz property of the derivative, it should become rapidly clear. In fact, I really only need to write out one or two lines because it's so, it's so, it, it, it pretty much, directly follows from the equation I'm about to write down. So if you differentiate the tensor product of a unitary like this, then you get a pretty, uh, <coughs> yeah, yeah, right, sorry. This wasn't completely written out. This is the Hamiltonian on the sector with n factors. This equation here hasn't been yet defined. We have to take the direct sum of this guy over all the n factors. All right, now that m should make some sense, what I've written. All right, and then the proof sketch, now I hope will just follow immediately. If we got the tensor product of ut to n times, you differentiate that, well, the equation we have for that is you had to differentiate the first factor, leave the rest alone, plus the derivative of the second factor, leave the rest alone, so on, that's the Leibniz property. And we get straight away this expression up here in the brackets. And then from this moment onwards, I hope you just, you can see directly that this will work on all the direct sum factors. And then you just have to take a direct sum of this expression. <laughs> <laughs> 
this argument, what it's done is it allows us now to build unitaries on our Fox face from unitaries on a single particle space, but it also allows us to build Hamiltonians on our Fox space from Hamiltonians on a single particle space. And we're going to do one example, which, although again, it's not at all complicated to check, when I write it out, it might look sort of odd at first sight. And that is the simplest Hamiltonian imaginable, namely the identity. So the identity Hamiltonian just represents a change of phase, as trivial as you can get, right? I mean, I suppose the zero Hamiltonian is trivialer. So let's, uh, well, while I'm erasing, you can think about what is d gamma s of the zero Hamiltonian. hope that one's clear. But d gamma s of the uh, identity Hamiltonian, now that, that's slightly more interesting. So let the single particle Hamiltonian be h. This represent a phase change. It's not even observable. And we're going to discover something quite interesting. The many particle version of this phase change operation, well, that's not, I mean, the first thing you might think to write down is the identity, right? It, it sort of, it, it, it feels, feels kind of right, but it's not, right? Actually, the second quantized, we call this the second quantized Hamiltonian from the identity is, is the number operator. Now, at first sight, that might look a bit odd. That somehow says that a phase change is, is observable. Well, no, actually, we're not quite saying that a phase change is observable. We're saying that the relative phase that you pick up between different numbers of particles is observable. So we can do an interference experiment and determine the number of particles. We can't observe the absolute phase, though. So it is worth pointing out that... Um, yep. No, that's, that's absolutely correct. So the n hat operator is defined, is, is an operator from the full Fox space to the full Fox space. Did I drop a uh, factor n was the question. So re remember, n is an operator that acts from the full Fox space to the full Fox space. It doesn't act on a, one of these n particle factors. Now, interestingly, right, this is an interesting fact. The identity is also an operator, a self-adjoint operator from, from the Hilbert space to the Hilbert space. It is a legal Hamiltonian, but it's not of the form d gamma s of something. So this is the Hamiltonian that represents a change in absolute phase of the, the full wave function. If you evolve according to this Hamiltonian, then your, your ket gets multiplied by e to the i phi. This operator, on the other hand, represents a phase change of each individual particle, each of which undergoes a phase change, and the phase change is different depending on the number of particles. So that's, that can be observed. This phase change, according to this Hamiltonian, cannot be observed because it's an absolute, represents an absolute change of the phase of a ket, right? So if you have some ket in full Fox space, then under time evolution, according to this Hamiltonian, it moves to this ket, which is not observable, right? But according to time evolution with respect to this Hamiltonian, Depending on the number of particles you have, you'll have a different relative phase and you'll be able to observe that phase shift in an interference experiment. So this guy is not of the form not of the form of some single particle Hamiltonian. 
Oh yeah, there's a nice little algebraic identity I should point out before we move on. D gamma S of the commutator of two operators is the commutator of the D gamma S's. That's pretty cool, very useful fact. Get to use that a lot. All right, now now it's gonna get it's gonna get serious. Now we're gonna write out bases for this Fox space, and this is the most tedious part of the whole business. As a, the mathematical part of ourselves likes basis free stuff. We don't like to write out bases. But if you ever want to put something on a computer and get a number out at the end, you're going to have to commit to a basis at some point. We therefore need to talk about bases. For this nice Fock Hilbert space that we built. And you can already see that infinity lurking in the definition of the Fox space. So you know it's not going to be completely trivial to write out a basis for this space. Nevertheless, it's worth the effort. And we're going to discover some quite remarkable facts in doing this. But in the end, we're going to try and do our damnedest to forget this basis and work with another formalism because it is super tedious. If you like combinatorics, then you'll find this a very exciting part of the course. There is a certain beauty to all the expressions I'm going to write out. But personally, I don't particularly like working with bases in Fox space. But as I said, you, if you want to do a calculation and you want to get a number at the end, you're going to have to commit to a basis. So there's two things that could have happened, right? If you start with a basis for your single particle Hilbert space, it might be the case that you, you cannot write out a basis for the full Fox space in any obvious way in terms of the single particle basis. Or it could be that you can. So the latter is the case. Uh, although there are very many interesting bases for Fox space that aren't directly based on the, the single particle basis. We'll give this basis a name from now on. It's going to be E mu. And mu is part of some label set. So we're, I'll just say so if we have an author, if we have a basis E mu for H, the single particle space. And I'm going to show you how to build a basis for gamma s of h. Now, e, uh, this single particle space can itself already be infinite dimensional. That's allowed. 
Well, okay, let's, you know. Okay, I won't call it I, I'll call it B. There's a pretty straightforward way to get a basis for a tensor product space, so let's start there. You have a basis for H. How do you get a basis for H tensor N? Well, you just tensor product the basis N times, and then you have yourself a basis for H tensor N. Okay, that was easy. What we're going to do is try the naivest thing possible, and it will almost work. So the naivest thing possible is to say, well, this is a good enough basis for H tensor N, but we want a basis for H S N, right? One thing we could do is just apply our projection operation P S to H N, we could just apply it to these basis vectors and hope we get a basis vector. This is like the simplest thing you could try. You take some basis, you want to get a basis for the subspace H S of N, just project the basis and hope that you get a basis out of the end. Well, uh, there's some obvious things that will go wrong when you try this strategy. Firstly, right, there's a lot of these basis vectors and H of S is a subspace. So not all of them can be linearly independent after the projection. Because presumably H S of N has a lower dimension than H tensor N. So if you apply a projection to some basis, it can't lead to a complete basis. It'll be at best over complete. Secondly, some vectors which may have been orthonormal before will no longer be orthonormal. That's another way of saying what I just said. And some may be annihilated by the projection operation. In fact, the best you could hope for is that when you apply P of S to a basis vector like this, like the app is that you get a uh, basis vector for this space or zero, right? That, that, that's the, the most optimistic possible outcome. You start off with a basis vector, you apply P of S and you get exactly what a basis vector for this space or zero. And the answer is it's almost that. So it, it's pretty good, but it's not, not quite perfect as a strategy to produce a basis. Now I'm going to try and, you know, the, uh, this notation is going to build up and build up as we go. The first thing is I'm going to change the notation here. These E's are completely superfluous. We may as well just write our basis vectors like this. Right, just get rid of the E's. The E were unnecessary. last line there is the observation I just made. If you apply a projection to a complete basis, you get a set of vectors spanning the space. You just don't know if they're orthonormal. <laughs> 
Now let's think about how this projection works. Turns out we know a lot about this projection. We know, for example, that this projection is a sum of unitary operators and each one of those just permutes things around. So we actually know what this projection operator is going to do on one of these vectors here. And that's kind of a remarkable piece of information that we can exploit. First thing we're going to find is that when this vector here is a permutation of another basis vector there, we're going to deduce something very nice about the linear independence of the projection applied to this vector and that vector. This is such a cool simplification. Let's have a basis vector, blah, blah, blah. Let's have another one. Let's now apply our projections to them and see what happens. Well, this is going to equal, they're going to be linear, linearly dependent. And in fact, they're li linearly dependent to the tune of a plus or minus one. Okay, that's an exercise to prove that. It follows exactly the strategy we followed to prove that PS is a projection in the previous lecture. So this is really remarkable because it says that the worst case would have been that when you apply this projection, you get some ghastly combination of, of basis vectors that are all linearly dependent with each other with differing numbers here that could have been irrational. I mean, it could be arbitrarily nasty, but it isn't. In fact, it's, it's almost as good as it can be. These vectors are either linearly dependent to the tune of a plus or minus one, or it'll turn out they're in fact orthogonal. Uh, or... Uh, a uh, uh, nightly. And we can characterize each of these vectors with something called occupation numbers. We can determine ahead of time whether or not they're going to be linearly dependent or not. 
This is an infinite list of numbers if the basis is infinite. So it's questionable whether you might consider this a simplification, but it is very useful, as we'll see. So what's going to happen, I can sort of foreshadow the answer. If your basis vector has the same occupation numbers as another basis vector, then they will be linearly dependent after projecting. And if they have a different occupation number set, they will be linearly independent, orthogonal even. And what we do is we summarize this list of numbers as a tuple. This is just another way of saying a list. And it's possibly an infinite list depending on the size of our basis. So if the basis or the index set B is infinite, then there's an infinite number of occupation numbers we have to worry about. Let's do an example. In fact, it's the same example from last lecture. Here we're going to look at the pretty much the simplest possible many particle space. Not quite the simplest, there's one simpler. We're going to look at three particles with single particle space C2. So three, three qubits, if you like, or three identical qubits, because they're not quite qubits. Remember, there's eight basis vectors. They were 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 1, 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 1. 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. So there's the eight basis vectors of H tensor 3. This is the space of three qubits. We're going to now find, find the action of PS, the projection, on these eight basis vectors. Actually, we're going to work out the occupation numbers first. So let's start. The occupation number n0 of the vector 0, 0, 0 is, well, let's look at the definition of the occupation number. There it is there. I can get rid of the ket. I don't need the ket in here. The occupation number of 0, 0, 0 is the number of times the digit 0 appears in the list. So there's three of them, right? One, two, three. And the occupation number of zero, zero, one is two, etc. Right? I'll just do some representative examples. Oops, that's only once. And I haven't worked out all the occupation numbers yet. I have to do n1 as well. Number of times 1 appears. Number of times 1 appears is 0 here. 
and there are I've only done four, there's four others you have to work out. We don't need to do that. Okay, I hope you get the idea. That's how you calculate occupation numbers. And now we can actually go ahead and calculate the action of our projection on these basis vectors and see what we get what comes out at the end. And here's where things get really quite interesting. It's P, S, P plus applied to 0, 0, 0. Sums over all permutations of this, these three numbers. Well, all, it's always going to get 0, right? 0, 0, 0. Every time you permute them, you always get the same answer. And you divide by the number of permutations. So that's easy, right? different. We permute all these guys around. That's the P pluses applied to all of these guys. There's four others you have to work out. But once you've done these, these four, then you, I think you can imagine how the rest of the story goes. Now, there's the P plus. The bosonic sector is kind of straightforward enough. You just sum up and move all the ones and zeros around. What about the fermionic sector? Does anyone know what that'll be? Any guesses? What, 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 what do I put here? There's minus ones in the story now, and there's plus ones. Any guesses? If you've got a bunch of things you add up and a bunch of things you subtract, the first guess you should try for is zero. There's six permutations of three things. You always get the same thing, no matter what you, whenever you permute these three zeros, you're always gonna get zero, zero, zero. Half of those permutations have a plus one, half have a minus one, it's zero. What about this guy? This is different. Or is it? Actually, it's also zero. In fact, they're all zero. P minus applied to any basis vector of H tends to three is zero, which tells us that H minus three is in fact zero. This is part of a general result that we'll see in the next lecture. You already know this. This is the Paldi exclusion principle at, at work. This is saying that if you have three fermions with an internal space with two dimensions, there's always going to be at least two fermions with the same state. So that's not allowed, right? So, And we'll uh, make that more quantitative in the next lecture. OK, I think I'm done, yes, with that example. Right, I think now's a good moment to stop, so I thank you for your attention.